I said, look, uh, John has left it to me because he thinks I'm perfectly capable of casting this part. And there's this person, I think she's really interesting. Would you look at it? And he looked at it and he said, uh, you're not going to go wrong with her. And that's how we cast the young lady. Harry Dean Stanton was, John Huston never read an actor. If any of you are familiar with, with uh, casting sessions, that you, generally an actor will come in, they will read a part, and you'll see whether by his reading or her reading, whether this is someone you like. He, he would never do, he never did that. Uh, he would, an actor or an actress would come in, he would talk to them. And um, uh, his rationale for that was that he thought that if they came in and give a good reading, that, that was all you'd ever get from them. Um, and so he was more interested in the people who would give you a mediocre reading, because then they would go home and study it and become it and, and go through the process which actors go through. And so we would just talk to them. And um, Harry Dean came in, and he was, you know, uh, fabulous, uh, an ex extraordinary character. And so he didn't have much trouble getting the part. Um, and Ned Beatty was um, uh, a favorite of both of ours, the play Hoover Schultz. If you want to get anywhere in the religion business, you've got to keep it sweet. I mean, it's just how. <laughs> it's so wonderful. You know? I mean, the whole history of half of the, of the religious, you know, these tele-evangelists that have 100,000 people to whom, whose money they squeeze out of their pockets every week. You know, and who are terrible crooks, all of them. <laughs> They're all just keeping it sweet, you know, just like Cooper Show. And, uh, and then Bill Hickey, I guess his name was. He was a famous acting teacher in New York. Uh, he was everybody's acting teacher. And uh, he lived with his mother. <laughs> and, um, uh, and of course, we needed, you know, what. Hazel Motes kills himself when he kills him. He's dressed like him, he looks like him. He's, um, uh, the, the whole point of all of that is that he's trying to kill off something which is him. Uh, he's a guy who's up, standing up there lying, just like he's standing up and lying, because he doesn't really, in the end, believe what he's saying. So it's, it's, uh, we needed somebody very odd, very quirky, very fragile, and, um, I thought he was kind of wonderful in that little part. So, yeah, it went like that, one by one, you know? Yeah. Who, whose idea was it to have John Huston himself play the role of the grandfather? Mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, John had done a fair bit of acting. It was only just a bit of fun for him uh, to act. But uh, we thought he would be sufficiently <laughs> forbidding <laughs> in that part and amusing. And so he easily took it on. Yeah. Uh, John, I get the impression John Huston was an omnivorous reader. He uh, was. Had he read Flannery O'Connor before you suggested? And it's a short he, novel, so he probably got to read it rather quickly. Yes, no, he, he'd read her, some of her short stories, but okay. he'd never read the novel. Very few people had read, you know, she was quite well known at the time right. as a short story writer. I mean, everyone. I mean, just even the, the, the phrase, a good man is hard to find, which comes from that, you know, has become a part of the <coughs> lexicon of the language. So he was familiar with her, but he had not read this novel before. Yeah. How did you choose uh, Tennessee Waltz as the song that was... We were fantastically lucky. There was this man called Alex North, who... Um, had by then had 28 Academy Award nominations as a composer. He had changed the history of music and cinema by doing the first jazz score for Elia Kazan's um, Streetcar Named Desire. Um, he had, incidentally, a, uh, a singular or a, uh, an astonishing uh, feat. He wrote the only piece of music that the censorship board of the United States ever cut out of a movie. Never happened before or after. Wow. They didn't touch the scene. They kept the scene. They just cut the music. It's amazing. Uh, it was in a streetcar named Desire. It was a solo saxophone piece. And they considered it so erotic <laughs> that uh, as to make the film pornographic. And they cut the music out, left the scene. Never happened before or after. 
And he'd done, of course, uh, Zapata, and he'd done, I mean, uh, uh, the first of Stanley Kubrick's films, Spartacus, I mean, an endless supply of wonderful films. And uh, we were lucky enough to have him, and he came up with the idea of doing the dance. In those days, it was different. You, uh, you, you spotted a movie with a composer, if you were the director or the producer, and then they went off and did it. And, uh, you know, and you took what they gave you. Not anymore. Anybody else? Yes. Why haven't you watched the movie in 40 years? Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> since you're here. Um, when I, I, haven't, I... I have never seen a film of mine with an audience. Ever. Anywhere. Um, I've been to 100,000 festivals. Um, <laughs> And you know I've been doing this for a lifetime, but I've never seen my, any film of mine with an audience. I can't do it, <coughs> and that comes from a an occasion in Los Angeles after I finished this film, before the film went to the Cannes Film Festival, where um, it was a, 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 essentially I say this in all modesty a triumph, uh, and it sort of changed my life. But uh, before that. I was asked by a man called Charles Champlin, who was a critic for the Los Angeles Times, to screen the film to an audience, an adult audience, of an adult film student audience of his. People, you know, lawyers and housewives and dentists and people who were <laughs> interested in cinema who would pay money and uh, see films under the, the uh, tutorship of Charles Champlin. And um, when I show the film uh, to one of his classes, which were amounted to about 400 people in a cinema, and would I then go on the stage with him and answer questions about it? And in my blissful innocence, I agreed to do this. Well, um, I turned up with my six cans of film and uh, brought them to the projectionist in the room filled with um, eager film students. And um, we started showing the film. And I could tell after the first minute or two that it was going to be a disaster. And I mean a real disaster. <laughs> and it just got worse from then on. And I was sitting in the middle of this crowd, paralyzed. I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. I was in a state of terror, which I've never had before or since. And the film, in due course, finished. And um, uh, the reaction was, to put it mildly, unfavorable. And by then, and then the lights went up, and the stage was there with two chairs, Chuck Tom and me. And by then, I had needed to go to the bathroom for at least an hour. <laughs> and it became more and more desperate. And I couldn't move. And I finally was able to get up and to go to the bathroom. And I could not urinate. it. My body was paralyzed, and I had to go out on the stage in this state of, I don't know if any of you have ever been desperate to urinate, but it's awful. And I was up there for an hour, um, basically fielding this extraordinarily abusive audience, <laughs> which hated it beyond all measure. And um, I've never been able to see anything with an audience ever again. Never. And I never will. I'll see it on my own. Why did they hate it so much? I don't know. Because for the same reason that I was sort of, to, which I sort of alluded to for a second ago, uh, I've been with Gabriel Garcia Marquez, I've been with John Katsi, I've been with W.H. Auden, I've been with an, in, an endless supply of people. And um, when they were giving lectures or talks or one thing or another, and, um, and I've been with them, when they told people beforehand that they would field questions, and when they didn't. And when I was there, I always cautioned them not to tell people beforehand, because of this thing, that people are not actually listening or watching. They're trying to think up of something intelligent to say. And if they don't understand anything, the only intelligent thing to say is something which is going to hurt you. And they'll do it, if only to appear smart. And that, I think, either that or the film was not good. But, uh, 
other people in other climes had a different reaction. So uh, whatever it was, was so horrifying that I have never wanted to repeat the experience in my life, and I never have. So with that, thank you very much, and good night. <laughs> not stop you from uh, your passion and your desire to communicate these stories to us. Um, thank you for this movie and this production. Um, and thank you for all the work you've done. We're all more interested in, in the rest of your movies as well. Um, but thank you for doing this because you've helped us in so many ways. And in fact, your story of getting this done and the story of your life, and the reason why you're even doing this is to introduce us to um, a way of looking at life and reality with this openness and wonder. I, I love this, uh, bringing us to the brink of this mystery. I love your connection with Hazel Motes. Um, this is something that we can all identify with in, in some ways in our, in our own lives and in our time today. So we thank you so, and for being here, for coming out to the East Coast, before you're going to Morocco, to be with us, to be in front of an audience, which is going to be terrifying, but to be here with us, uh, we, we deeply uh, appreciate this, that you could, you could be with us, Mike. Thank you so much. It's a joy.